Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Embracing Radical Change. I am your host, Jocelyn Mercado, and today I am very excited to present Cater Brown. Welcome, Cater. Good morning, Jocelyn. It's wonderful to be here. So excited to have you as a part of the event. So for everyone gathering in this event, you are invited to join with us in global conversations with 27 cutting edge experts and thought leaders who will guide you to connect with the truths in your heart, to unlearn the illusions of our modern world, and to activate bold new perspectives about the future of humanity. So Cater, um, for, for those who may not know about your work already, let me go ahead and read your bio and introduce you. Cater Brown is a ceremonialist, healer, intuitive, diviner, and teacher of psychological and spiritual awareness with over 33 years of professional experience. Over this time, he has developed an effective and unique approach to emotional and spiritual healing by braiding together his in-depth knowledge of, uh, sorry, his depth of clinical knowledge of experiential psychotherapies with more nature-based indigenous wisdom teachings and healing methods from around the world. Cater is the founder and director of Rites of Passage Council. His nature-based ceremonies and training programs are offered both nationally and internationally. His previous work has taken him across the United States and into Ireland, England, Scotland, West Africa, Australia, and Hawaii. Cater lives in the highlands of North Asheville, North Carolina. And to learn more about Cater's ceremonial offerings, you can sign up for his newsletter at caterbrown.com, and I'll provide a more uh, direct link for that in just a little bit. Um, and so your topic for today, Cater, is rites of passage initiation and the rewilding of human nature. And I'm so excited to talk with you about this. So. Yeah. Excited to be here. Yeah, wonderful. And let me just welcome everybody who's signing on live right now. So if you're joining us on Zoom, um, go ahead over to the chat and put in your name and your location. It's always wonderful to see where everybody is joining us from. So go ahead and enter that in the chat. And so Cater, to get started, um, could you tell us what is the origin or what are the origins of, of rites of passage and why are they important for us? Um, gosh, the origins of rites of passage go back like way, way back. I would even say the origins are um, really in the hearts and minds of our indigenous ancestors. Um, and there's a, a belief construct that uh, I have <clears throat> Uh, run into and, and uh, noticed in a lot of different uh, indigenous cultures. And that would be the idea that um, we come into this world having made agreements with particular ancestors that carry a similar frequency of, of medicine or gift or way of being in the world that we carry. And uh, it would be as if uh, from that place you look down here and said wow they're in a big mess down there i really have something that'll help <laughs> i better get down there quick because they're in trouble and so based on something like that uh, indigenous people say we make those agreements and our coming here is we, we come here on the well, the way i think of it is we come here with the blessing of our ancestors and the prayers of our descendants that bring us into this world to offer um the essence of who we are in this unique way. And so rites of passage, uh, initiatory rites of passages um, are designed to uh, activate the memory of those agreements, those relationships and those ways of being in the world um, that uh, serve the greater community, the human and the non-human, the living and the non-living community. Um, and so the, the initiatory passages, the rites of passages, um, in those ancient ways were, you know, guided by elders, initiated themselves, um, to assist, uh, others, whether we, we generally think of rites of passage as being something that happens in, in, um, youth. Uh, a coming of age type of ceremony, but that's just a small portion. Um, often in my stories, I talk about this 
uh, this place that we grow to a betwixt in between, you know, when we're not where we used to be and we're not yet in this new place, kind of like we are in this global situation we're in, you know, we're not in a new place and we're no longer in this complete old place. And we're in this betwixt in between place. Um, and, uh, often stop and saying, you know, what happens around, you know, that, that age of 14 or, or 24 or 34 or 44, 54, 64, 74, 84, you know, that place that we all get into. Um, and so rites of passages are ways to reawaken, um, memory, belonging, and connection. Um, and when I look at this, uh, you know, embracing radical change, um, this, the, the topic of this series that, that you're doing. Um, now think about rites of passage for the, for the individual, and that would be that they would uh, go out on the mountain to make themselves worthy of being seen by a vision that is looking for them. That's the way I would say it. It's not this, not this new age way of uh, thinking I can create my own reality or I can create my own dream. Um, it's more to uh, empty yourself and make yourself ready uh, for a vision that has been stalking you uh, even before you got here and, and to wake up to that. So there's something that call, really calls you forward um, into your life with, with some, uh, some intention and purpose. Um, and I started thinking about the title of this series and I thought, you know, globally, we're in that place of betwixt in between, you know, the, the, the stories that uh, Joanna Macy talks about the, you know, the, the story of, you know, we're all going, you know, it's all just going to go to hell and we're all going to, you know, it's just going to implode and there's no hope and, and why I really do anything. And then the other story of what's called, what she calls the great turning, um, that no, there are things happening, um, that we are making these shifts. Um, and then the third story, which is, you know, don't people just not really paying attention and have their heads in the sand. Um, so in rites of passage, there was this understanding you, you, go out on the mountain or you go into the ceremony, not for yourself. Um, and I like telling my, my uh, uh, participants this a lot in the ceremonies we do. It's like, we don't, you're not doing this for ourselves. We're doing this for the greater community. You don't go out on the mountain for yourself. Um, you go out on the mountain for your people, um, the human and non-human people. Um, so as the Lakotas were that the Hemblecha, the cry for a vision, um, I think of is uh, different than, again, this new age way of I can create the, any, any life I want, um, but more of um, go out with my palms empty, my heart open, and make myself worthy for the vision that is looking for me. Um, so that when we find that that calling, um, that it be one that uh, we, we can live into and, and it become a, a prayer answered for many other people as we live into it. Um, so rites of passages have existed all over the planet throughout history. Um, the popular ones in, in this North America, you know, we would call the vision quest of the, uh, the indigenous peoples of these lands. Um, in Australia, you might, you might, they would be talking about the walkabout. Uh, the, um, in the British Isles, they, they call it hill walking or mist walking. Mm -hmm. um, so this way of severing from the old identity and going out uh, alone into the wilds um, to, uh, uh, in both fasting and in prayer, um, that's what I say, making yourself available to the vision that's looking for you, um, as opposed to um, trying to effort to make something happen. Um, so it's a very, it's a very much of a surrendered place, this uh, rite of passage experience. And in our culture, um, these ancient ways have uh, 
of initiatory passages for the most part have been um, pushed aside for what I call pseudo initiations. And these are the initiation passages that we all go through, you know, what is, uh, you know, high school, you have graduation and probably some big party where um, consciousness is definitely altered, but not in the way that we're talking about altering consciousness. <laughs> um, where rites of passages um, in their more traditional sense would um, infuse one with a new sense of responsibility and an expanded awakened sense of consciousness and relationship to the greater, greater life. Um, and some, in some tribal cultures, they would talk about how the cord is severed from the biological mother and it's reattached to the greater mother. And so that one then becomes in service uh, to that, to the greater earth. And, uh, and when that doesn't happen, um, we can also say that does contribute uh, to a um, uh, kind of a mythological mindset of modernity that then uh, justifies violence toward the feminine, you know, because it's, those things don't happen. So I, I look through that particular lens as I see all that's kind of going on in the world and, and think that, um, you know, if these things were still in place in their more traditional way, um, and how can we renew, bring them back? Um, so that the rewilding of, of um, human consciousness or the uh, uh, human nature is really about relationship. Um, it's um, the indigenous way of being was in deep relationship with the, the ones around them. And so that's when I think about what does it mean to rewild human nature, uh, you know, slow down and enter into relationship with the ones around you, um, you know, from a heartful place. It's, it's hard to discriminate and have judgments when we have connection with, with others. It's in the absence of those connections that would create all these other, you know, judgments and categories of beliefs that uh, God is in the mess we're in. Um, anyway, I could I could probably go on and on for the whole hour, but I'll pause and. Yeah, well, the, yes. There's a, a couple of things that I really want to highlight what, from what you've said so far. One is the the idea of this the vision that's stalking us, or the vision that's looking for us, mm -hmm. and we've talked about this in in a couple of the other interviews, at least two of the others so far, um, about you know paying tuning into what's trying to get our attention. Mm -hmm. And I, and I feel that in these times of radical change that we are experiencing in the world, um, it's really critically important to open up in this way. And as you're saying here, not to, not to try to force something to happen because with your thinking mind, you're thinking that's the way it needs to go, but right. to be really open to what's trying to get our attention, the vision that right. is looking for us. Right. This, this, uh, it requires a severance, you know, in the, in the rite of passage, there are, there are distinct phases, what I call, uh, what could be called the calling phase, which could look like a spiritual awakening, or it could look like a train wreck. <laughs> Both of them will call us to a different way of being. Um, then there's the severance phase and the severance phase of the rite of passage is that, um, peeling away, you know, all the, the ways in which we define ourselves, all the letting go of the attachment to all that we've known, um, all that we've been connected to. When I say attachment to that, that doesn't mean go out and just, you know, let go of everything and, and you know, divorce uh, your partner and, and get out of this job immediately. It means let go of the attachment to it. Um, so when you, and then the severance phase uh, is followed by the threshold phase. And that's that middle ground of, of surrender, uncertainty, and uh, where we encounter, the idea is that we make ourselves ready to encounter something greater than ourselves. Um, and uh, 
So it's only by that complete surrender, um, you know, surrendering, uh, like surrendering so deeply in winter that spring simply shows up by itself because we let go enough and for no other reason. Um, and that's a, it's a tearful place. It's a place of grief, a place of uh, uncertainty. Um, you know, in, in the traditional rites of passage, uh, surviving was not a guarantee. Um, in modern day rites of passage, the, the perceived risk is just as potent. Um, and there is still some risks involved. Um, but I'll, I love Joanna Macy, uh, one of our, said our grandmothers of ecological awareness and, and uh, agent of change, um, calls this uh, uh, the, the knife's edge of uncertainty that we're in is where most creativity comes alive. Wow. Uh, when we're not certain, um, and not to delude ourselves with uh, you know, new age certainty of, you know, if I just think happy thoughts. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so this, like we're balancing that knife edge of uncertainty and there are amazing things happening in the world with things young people are creating and, and new ways of uh, ecological uh, attention and environmental and sociological and political and, and economic. There are new systems that are wanting to emerge um, through the hearts and minds of, of the younger generations. Um, so those things are happening, um, but this this idea of um, the rite of passage is that there is no one that's gonna there's no one that's gonna save me, and um, and no one's gonna live my life for me. So what is my uh, relationship to my own mythology, um, or have I just adopted the mythology of the greater culture? You know, which, you know, we'd say is spun in a web of isms, the consumerism and uh, sexism and lookism and all the different isms that the culture will hand us is, is, is the, the cultural mythologies. Um, and if we don't have a way of connecting with our own deep personal mythology um, that's ancestrally connected, um, then we just end up living in that... Uh, um, sleep state uh, of, uh, you know, society's myths. Um, so rites of passage were to um, connect one more deeply with the vision, as you, I like your words, the vision that is stalking us. Um, and it's not something found through effort, it's something found through surrender. Um, and we could say prayer, or meditation, or gratitude, or um, for me, it often often happens in a pool of grief is when it seems to come knock at the door and say, okay, that's good. We'll, we'll come now. You're finally there. <laughs> can't, can't pretend to be there and say, okay, now I'm ready. It's like you have to be, uh, have to be broken wide open. Yeah. And in the broken open places, uh, grace uh, seems to have a way of getting in there and, and finding us and helping us remember you know, the, this uh, way of being that is unique to us. Um, because if uh, nobody else is going to be us, you know, if, if uh, um, it, it's that whole, the, the other thing about the, the society's mythologies, it's, it's also has this better and less than thinking mm -hmm. um, paradigm. And so if you can be better than, then you can feel good today, but tomorrow you might feel less than. And this more indigenous paradigm says you can't be better the same way you can't be less. You can simply be you or not be you. Um, and you didn't come here to be somebody else. Um, and, and frankly, we all need you to be you because you have something that the rest of us need. Um, and it's, um, you know, we, we put, uh, a group out on the actually put a couple of groups out on the mountain in the past month and um, that morning I was sending them out um, in the threshold ceremony and I felt myself tearing up it's like you're going out there for us 
You know, you're going out there because there's something you have to offer um, that's vitally important that I can't do and nobody else here can do, but, or be, not to confuse uh, gift with doing all the time. Um, and so this gratitude that, yeah, they, they, they go out there to awaken into more deeply of who they are, to bring that back uh, because we need it. Um, and so that, uh, that kind of vision, you know, is not yeah. something we can create with our strategic thinking mind. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And, and there's um, something you said recently to a, a group, a smaller group um, of ours that I can't remember exactly, but it was about, you know, when we, when we do these ceremonies, when we do these rites of passage, we're doing it not just for, for, you know, the earth and those who are alive right now, but we're doing it for our descendants. Right, right. There's, it's, it's to, to literally think of um, the way in which we live our lives should be an answer to the prayers of our descendants. When this, uh, you know, when we, when we start talking, not in terms of past lives, but if we talk about parallel worlds, it's like their prayers are happening right now. And how we live our lives is, is we're showing them what to do when they get here. So may the way in which we live our lives uh, be, a, be a blessing to them in, in a way that they, both for their trust in us and also that accountability. Um, and that's, uh, you know, some of the native teachings talk about, you know, live your life with the awareness of the next seven generations. Um, and again, not just human. Uh, we tend to narrow those those languages down to the to human category. Um, so yeah, this um, that's what it's about now. And, and the idea that that you and I and everyone listening and everyone out there has something unique to bring to the table that no one else can bring. Um, and, uh, and, and no matter what it is, um, you know, it's important that it, that it be brought. Even it's, it's, most of the time, it's simply a way of being. Um, I know a lot of times in, in this uh, culture of, of self-help and, and where, you know, the bookstores are filled with self-help. And I love, I love hearing some of those uh, teachers like Marion Williamson, I heard recently a, a quote from Marion Williams say, we need to get over ourselves. <laughs> and there's a, in the self-help aisle is way too big, you know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we're spending a lot of time and money on that, trying to help ourselves. Are you there? I think we're having a little little technical glitch here. Um, can you hear me okay? I don't know if you can hear me, Cater, but our, the screen is frozen from what I can tell here. So we'll, we'll hang on for a minute and I'm sure you'll, I'm sure the connection will come back in. For my end. Can you I can hear you just a little bit. Um, still, still <laughs> seems a little. Can you see me? Okay. Okay. Now I can hear you. I the screen is still frozen as it has been for a minute now. Um, I can hear you better though. Okay. Okay. I think it just clicked back in. Now I can see. Are we, are we lined up again? I okay. think so. All right. Well, I'm sure the most important thing that you and I will say was about to happen. I don't know what that was, but. It um, does work that way. It sure does. <laughs> yes. I think we were just talking about the idea of, of our, uh, of, of, of being aware of the collective and not just our own kind of narrowly defined challenges and needs. Um, yes. 
Yes, and um, and I wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit about you know when we enter into an initiation. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, perfectly. When we're when we're entering into an initiation, um, and and tell me if you agree that you know I, I I'm getting the sense that as I as I'm listening to you, I'm just feeling so strongly that you know this what's happening in our world right now is is really mm -hmm. pulling us into an initiation, right? Um, yeah. yeah, I see it as a global initiation. Mm -hmm. Like globally, we are in that place of the twixt in between. Yeah. Um, the the danger is looking to our governments and our systems to reorder things so that we can move into the new um, without doing the personal uh, deep dive ourselves. Um, you know, it's always said it's at the grassroots level that change is really rooted strong enough to happen. Um, and so, you know, there, there is no one, as the Hopi elders said many years ago, you know, you are the ones you've been looking for. There is, uh, and, and so how can I, um, in my own personal, you know, small life on this planet, begin to work with that and be, be more true to who I am in relationship to all that is around me. Um, and so that, uh, so yeah, we're definitely in a global initiatory passage um, where survival is not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. so it's time to surrender the old and really open hearts and hands to the new wisdom, new ideas, new identities, um yeah and and what you said there about you know the um that the real change is going to come from each individual right and from grassroots efforts not from our government so it's so it's really powerful what's happening right now that our government and our faith in our government you know especially what's happening here in the u.s mm -hmm. and, and in other countries too is it's just becoming clear that this is not the um the leadership that we wanted and it's it's crumbling and it's falling apart right and we have to be really careful about not being seduced into a, a discourse of animosity mm -hmm. yes um as a way of avoiding the the personal responsibility of the gift that we each came here to deliver um, because i see that happen a lot we look at these systems of government or corporate and you know we get seduced into this discourse of animosity and 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 back and forthness and it's like that that's uh that's that's not the that's not where to put our attention uh, to, to put our attention around something that wraps its arms around all of it and not this whole back and forthness um and and uh and then that idea of how can i how can i do that in my life um so that every area where I find myself seduced into these discourses of animosity and frustration or, or even collapsing into grief, I can probably find the place in my life where I'm being asked to step up that I'm um, somehow avoiding. Um, and it's, uh, well, it's, it's that old thing, you know, when we, when we focus on obstacles, we often get more obstacles. When you focus on the delivery of your medicine, delivery of your gift or who you are in the world, we often don't show up on the radar of the obstacles. Um, and that's where to, to put the attention, you know, to not be naive. Um, there's, you know, really destructive, uh, challenging things happening in the world. And we need to look at them mm -hmm. um, and not just have this naive perspective that all will be well. Um, but, but holding the, you know, that sharp edge of the balance of, really looking at the challenge, facing it, um, and yet um, having it inspire us with new creativity. Um, reminds me of uh, um, kind of the, the, the state of our society, reminds me of this story that uh, a friend and teacher Melodoma Somme shared with me <laughs> some years ago. He said, you know, <clears throat> there, was a, there was a man in the village and um, he went to sleep in his, in his uh, hut. And in the middle of the night, 
he woke up and there sitting beside of him uh, was death. And he looked at death and it just, you know, it scared the shit out of him and he didn't know what to do. And he freaked out and he jumped up and he started running, 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 ran all the way to the next village and paused and then thought about it for a minute. And thought, you know, this isn't far enough. You know, so it kept running, running long into the night. Mm-hmm. And then he uh, gets so exhausted, he falls over um, and briefly falls asleep. And you know that feeling we sometimes get when we're trying to fall asleep and our body jolts awake? Well, he had that. And he was like, oh, no, death is, you know, I'm not far enough away. So he takes off running again. Runs all the way to the next morning, to the furthest outpost village, so exhausted, can't go any further, falls over, falls asleep. Sometime in the late afternoon, probably sun going down, he wakes up again. And there sitting beside him is death. And his eyes get really wide and death looks at him and says, you know, I came to see you back there in the first village to tell you I would meet you here. <laughs> so, um, so often I see us approaching the, the, uh, the dilemmas and challenges that way of, of the man in the village. You know, we have to look at these things. We have to look at the hard things. Um, and, uh, and there's also this other place that the Buddhist and, and many uh, indigenous people death your, your ally. And death and I, it means that we have... Um, Cater, it's breaking up a little bit again here. Um, so if you can hold, if you can hear me, hold on for just a second till we get back past this moment come on you hear me okay it's it went out for a little bit so you were just starting to say um to see death as our ally right as many teachings like the buddhist teachings and other indigenous teachings talk about um to make the way i say it is to make death an ally is to to deepen our relationship with all that is around us Uh, the hard things the beautiful things um, and to slow down, to take time. Um, you know, I've, I've heard that some of the, the most deeply sacred people are the, the ones on death row mm-hmm. uh, because they're, they're looking right at it. And, when you, and I've heard when you, when, if you were to look in their cells, you may see all these paintings of, of Jesus or these, these sacred images. Or, we're in this we're in this time period globally this knife edge that uh, Joanna Macy talks about really um, what's ahead and let that stir our creativity and our, our deepening relationship to each other um, so that if you and I are walking down a road and somewhere down this road we know that we're going to encounter death um, how do we want to walk down this road together, you know, and, and um, with what kind of attention and awareness uh, to each other, to, to our surroundings, to the, again, the other than human others. Um, so it's like we're, walk, we're all walking down this road. So the question is not uh, what's down the road, but the question is how do we, how do we want to walk down this road? Um, and how do we, leave a bit of the road left when we're gone for our descendants, for our grandchildren. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just think of your, your children's children. I can, that's close enough to home, you can imagine, for most people. Um, I don't want to leave something here uh, that they can pick up and that'll be useful. Um, well, let's... let's uh, yeah, thank you for that. And so one other one other question that's coming to mind, um, you know, I think a lot of people who are listening are are really feeling this this initiatory passage that we're in and are going through challenges and, and you know, big 
big difficulties in their lives of all different sorts. So we were talking a little bit about um, the gatekeepers before we went live here. So I wonder if you would speak a little bit about that. Yeah, that's my, that's my personal name for those kind of energies that are both internal and, and external is that when we, um, when you begin the, uh, the initial or you, you, and it may be something where you, it could be as simply as signing up for some kind of workshop that's really going to expand your awareness or uh, anything that you do that is about expanding awareness and consciousness and, and really shift in your life. Uh, on the journey there, you encounter, I call them the gatekeepers. And in, in mythologies around the world, gatekeepers are there to challenge us, to trick us, to give us a riddle that if we can answer the riddle, we'll get to go through the gate. Uh, oftentimes, there's a, a type of a wounding or a scar that happens to remind us that we've crossed it. Um, and so it's uh, not necessarily an indication to turn around or that... Uh, or that I'm heading in the wrong direction. Um, it keeps freezing up here. I wonder if we should um, turn off our video and um, I don't know if you can hear me right now, but I think maybe if we both turn off our video, it will, it will be able to broadcast more easily. Um, let me, um, I'm going to send this a uh, quick note to anybody that's in my house, not to uh, use the computer. I don't know if that has any. Okay. And we can also, you know, we could, we could turn off our video. That'll decrease the bandwidth that it is using. Um, let's see. If I click this, it cuts my video off. Does yeah. that help some? Um, yeah. Let's see if. Yeah, let's try that and um, let's just see. We'll see how you're, I'll do the same too, just to decrease the bandwidth. So mm -hmm. let's go, go on ahead and let's just see if maybe the audio will come through more clearly now. Okay. All right. Um, so where were we? Um, the, um... Yeah. Oh, I think you had just said that it, you know, so when you, when you say yes to something, you know, and then you hit and then run into the gatekeepers, it's not necessarily a reason to, to turn around and go back. You know, it doesn't mean it, that you have to stop. Right. It may, it may mean you have to surrender, likely. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so, so challenge at the gateway to uh, at the thresholds uh, are to be expected. Um, and um, Reminds me of a, a story uh, that Michael Mead tells called the, it's an old story called the water of life. And in the water of life, the king is wounded. And the king has three sons. And uh, the king hears that there's this water of life that will restore the king to health. And, and in stories, and, and particularly in the British Isles, the, the king or anything sovereign represents the land. So say the king is wounded means the land is in trouble. Uh, um, so these sons hear about the water of life and um, uh, the first son says, well, thanks. Well, if I can find this water of life. I'll, I'll be in my father's good favor and he'll give me the kingdom. So the oldest son says, I'm going to find the water of life. And he takes off out of the castle and he's uh, riding you know, fast through the, through the gate. Uh, and right after he gets outside the gate, he, Encounters this uh, dwarf on the road, um, and dwarfs like in um, you know uh, Sleeping Beauty, uh, little people. And every culture has little people are considered people close to the earth, connected to earth, uh, in nature. Mm -hmm. So he encounters this uh, this little person, and the little person says, "You know, oh, where are you off to in such a hurry?" And this, uh, this oldest brother says, you know, I'm, I'm off. Uh, who are you to be talking to me, basically? I don't have time for you. I've got this mission I'm doing. I'm, you know, just out of my way. And he flies past the, the little person, the dwarf, and, and the, the, the dwarf, uh, the little person puts him in some kind of a trance and, and causes him to have this great challenge. 
um, that he can't get out of and he's lost. And, and then, so the second brother comes along and uh, we heard from the oldest. So the second oldest says, you know, if I can, maybe if I can find the water, I'll be in my dad's favor and I'll get the, get the kingdom. And he pretty much does the same thing. He takes off out of the castle and, and he uh, riding at a, you know, fast pace um, and um, encounters the dwarf and the dwarf says, you know, Sir Knight, where are you off to in such a hurry? And he replies pretty much the same way. I'm, you know, who are you to be talking to me? I've got places to go and things to do and I'm busy here and get out of my way. And, you know, he flies past the dwarf um, and, and the dwarf fixes him in a trance and, uh, and he's stuck and, and lost. And, and then finally the youngest brother. Now, the youngest brother represents uh, in the tarot deck the fool, the, the, the naivety that's required to begin the journey. Mm. Um, and so the youngest brother goes to the king, gets his blessing after much discussion and challenge about even getting the blessing to go look for this water. And he rides out of the castle and he counters the dwarf. And the dwarf says, you know, Sir Knight, where are you off to? And the knight stops, the youngest brother stops, and he says, I have no idea. My father's sick, and I need to find this water of life, and I have no idea where it is, and I don't know where I'm going. And so then the dwarf gives him certain tools, and of course the story goes on and on and on. Uh, but the dwarf would be that gatekeeper. Um, and the youngest brother, um, met the gatekeeper, surrendered. As I say, palms open, heart open. I have no idea where I'm going. Uh, I have this task to find the water. Of, I don't know where it is. Um, and, and that level of openness and surrender uh, touched the, the little person, and he gave him certain tools that he would need on the journey to help him find his way. Um, and so that's... Uh, um, a way of these gatekeepers that we encounter can show up in many forms. Um, that's one form. Sometimes they can show up in terms of um, whatever uh, issues you have that you haven't worked out are going to get loud and start screaming. Um, because uh, anything unresolved can't really exist on the other side of this threshold passage. Um, so if there are old behaviors, old thoughts, old ways of being, as you get close to this threshold, they start getting loud. Um, especially those old ways of being and thoughts and feelings and, and stories that you have about yourself or others that are not going to serve you on the other side. Um, they're going to start getting really loud and challenge you at the gate. Um, and that's another kind of a, a, a gatekeeper. Um, but in both cases, we're, we're required to, to let go. That's the severance. Um, so the, the gatekeepers met uh, during the severance phase of the initiatory passage before we enter the threshold phase. Okay. Um, very often, anyway. So could you tell us a little bit more about um, what do rites of passage and rewilding have to do with our sociological and political and environmental uh, challenges at this time? I know you started to say a little bit about that, but I'd love to hear more. Um, it, it's in, in my way of thinking, and because this is my particular lens that I look through, um, when I say rewilding of human nature, I'm speaking of um, a level of awareness and attention uh, that is that that we bring to things awareness attention and relationship that we bring to all that is around us um, it is the result of this narrowing awareness um, both in um, time and space we'll say so if my Time and space awareness is kind of my needs and awarenesses are focused on, you know, what I need personally and in my home or my family or my immediate community. Um, and it doesn't go out very far. It maybe goes all the way to my retirement or maybe 
a little bit left over for my kids, you know, then my, my sense of time and space is not very broad and not very, very deep. Um, it doesn't go very far into the future and it doesn't go very wide um, in terms of relationally um, and may not go out beyond the human realm. Um, so this uh, rewilding of human nature is about bringing us to a level of attention and awareness uh, that in breadth, breadth and depth and time and space is quite expansive. You know, so now I'm thinking about uh, the way in which I live my life and how it impacts uh, generations to come um, and how it impacts people around the world. Um, you know, we, we, we're shifting, even globally, there was a shift between the globalization of consciousness and economic systems and sociological systems and environmental systems. And now this, uh, this kind of contraction of, um, uh, uh, I don't what we call it, kind of, I guess we call it falls under the name of, of patriotism or where we contract and we narrow our focus and our attention to what is immediate, which is kind of, I'm just going to worry about me and my country or my place um, and, and get as much of the resources as I can and make sure I protect them, uh, you know, for me um, or my immediate. And so there's this kind of contraction expansion that's happening. This, this movement of the pendulum that's moving back and forth. Um, and so, um, you know, we're all walking down this road together. Um, and so it's like giving attention uh, to all of it, to all of us, to all that is around us. Um, and that's what I mean by the, uh, and how that impacts economic systems, um, environmental systems, sociological systems. It, it brings a, a type of awareness uh, to it that is much more, um, relational in context to others. And again, when I say the word others, I mean not just human others. Yes, um, yes. And uh, because when I have relationship with the others, um, it, it's challenging for me to make decisions that are so narrowly focused or self-serving um, because I can see how it's going to impact uh, these ones that I have relationship with, you know, um, in Asheville, there's, uh, uh, one of the roads I drive on the way to my house. Um, uh, people tend to go fast on this road and, and it's, uh, a narrow road. And, um, and a few, I've seen a few signs out there. Well, pe people have made these signs that says drive like your children live here. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, that's, that's that similar concept. Live, uh, live your life with the clear awareness that your children are inheriting uh, and uh, what you're giving them. Yes. Um, yes. To expand our awareness um, and our children's children. And, and, and not just in a linear into the future kind of perspective, but also across the planet. Um, awareness, how my actions... Uh, in my life can impact, you know, others globally. Um, and what's my responsibility? Uh, what level in of integrity am I going to be operating from with that kind of awareness? Um, so that's, that's what I mean. It, it, it will expand that. Uh, most people that go on uh, through these experiences come back with a much deeper sense of connection and relationship. Uh, to the others, the other humans, other uh, non-human realm, um, be it the, the environment, um, their community, be it their church community, their school community. Um, you know, it's, it, it just expands relational uh, connection. Um, and it's funny, we have these things we call connection technology that do everything but bring us into connection. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm, I'm, guilty of it. I'm, I'm guilty of it too. But every now and then I'll put, I'll put my phone down and look around the room and I see all these people together, but not really together at all. Yes. Um, and, uh, so where, you know, I can start by attending to, you know, my connections. How, how do I do that? How do I bring more attention and awareness to those around me? Um, you know, we, uh, some of the old, the old ways of indigenous people is they had way more uh, use of verbs than we have. Mm. And, and this idea that um, language informs perception, perception uh, informs beliefs and beliefs go underground and run, to run our lives mm. and some kind of subconscious level that we're not even aware of. And so at the level of where language informs perception, um, you know, I think back into many indigenous cultures where they had way more use of verbs than they had nouns. Because when you use a verb uh, as a, a context of relating to, to something, you're held in a, a relational field with that other. Um, when, it, when it's spoken that way, that, that an identity is not a fixed thing. Um, it, it's a moving relational uh, interaction. Um, and so we've, we have probably three times as many more nouns than a lot of indigenous cultures have. Oh, interesting. And so when we, when we name something, um, you know, then we have this, what, what they call in psychology is kind of object relationship. Um, and we actually disconnect. And then a further step is when we categorically name something like, um, we go from this living interaction with nature and this and the singing mountain to uh, trees. And now I don't even know the name of the the actual tree, but it's just or the, even worse, what people call the green wall. You know, I have no relationship to any of it. And so this way of you know, let's begin maybe simply by living, learning the names of the trees and the plants around where you live. Uh, and the animals that live there and the birds that live there. Um, so often when I go into the woods, I, I, I remind people, I say, you know, these, these birds you see flying around here uh, and these uh, animals that we've seen, they're not just passing through. They actually live here <laughs> within a, a general radius of where we are. And right. if you pay attention, you'll notice their habits and you'll enter into relationship with them. Right. They're our neighbors, too. Right, and they and they're like right here, like on where I live. I know the the uh, the, uh, the woodpecker that lives right here at the house. The two hawks that f frequently come at certain times of day. Mm -hmm. This other place on the river I go to, I like I know the two blue heron and what times of day they go up the river and what time of day they go down the river. Yeah, um, it, it's like we have to slow down and enter into. Uh, relationship and that's what i that's what i mean by the rewilding it's a type of awareness um of how we hold and, and connect with those around us um yeah this is so so important what you're sharing here about relationship and relationship not just with the other humans but with all of the beings you know and with the trees and with the with the plants and the weeds growing near us that are actually you know amazingly medicinal you know plants and 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 the birds and so on and i think this is something that is so important for us to be uh modeling for our children and grandchildren and and instilling in them mm -hmm. um this relationship and just you know being present so in in the human realm being present with one another instead of being on screens all the time Mm -hmm. And this is, I have a five-year-old and an eight-year-old and both of them, you know, they, what they experience at school and what they see their friends doing, it is so focused on staring at screens. And mm -hmm. so they come home and they know that, you know, the screens are not really happening here. Right. And um, it's, it's, it's an interesting dynamic that I'm finding more, more and more difficult to nav navigate, but it's, you know, I'm, I'm standing firm on that. So I think that's something we can really, it's a, such a gift we can give to our young people right now to, to model this being in relationship. 
Yeah, and to remind, remind ourselves and, and young people um, that uh, boredom is one of those gatekeepers. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So when we, when we encounter boredom, uh, the idea is not to get busy or distracted or get inter be entertained by something. Mm -hmm. um, the idea is like, oh, I've, I've met a gatekeeper. Now, if I lean into this, it'll eventually break through. And when you break through boredom, you break through to an expanded awareness um where we're we're out of habitual thinking mind um and so to again see to see boredom as one of those gatekeepers that we have to get by yeah i love to, that idea we're supposed to avoid or somehow you know oh my gosh i'm, I'm bored so i have to go do something, it's like, do something. Let's, <laughs> let's lean in here and see what actually cracks open yeah um, and and the cracking may occur through through tears or or even some frustration, but it will crack if you don't run from it. Um, I love that. I am going to keep that is really helpful to me <laughs> in relation and, uh, to my kids. This uh, to to um, to truly know and have relationship with place is not so much about what you can tell me about a place. Um, it's more about how much the the other than human world knows you in that place so are you authentically available uh, to the others that live in this place to the mockingbird to the squirrel you know to the rabbit to the you know are you do they know your name and are they familiar with you um and that's what i said that's when we uh uh, to belong to a place is to be known by it. Not really how much I can tell you about what I know about it. It is really to be known by the place itself. Um, and uh, Stephen, Stephen Foster, um, the, one of the co-founders with Meredith Little of the School of Lost Borders, uh, I apprenticed with years ago. And I, he, he told me one time, he said, if you want to make any place sacred in nature, go there and sit there long enough and notice every detail of everything that's happening around you. And once you've given your attention and your relational awareness to everything that's happening around you, uh, you'll cross this borderland where all of a sudden that place is sacred. Um, Beautiful. And so it's, uh, you know, it, it, that's what's, that's my judgment. what's missing this way of, um, you know, it's the simple things. It's, it's attention uh, slowing down with your cup of coffee in the morning and going out and sitting in the yard and, and drinking your coffee and just, just giving your attention to all the life that's happening around you um, and let it give its attention to you. Um, you know, and have, uh, even if that's a daily spiritual practice of, of uh, how you drink your coffee in the morning or something. Um, mm -hmm. But anything that, that brings you into relationship. Um, in my conversations about death earlier, or, or the, the man who ran from death, is like uh, we're caught in this uh, um, spinning wheel where we're running. Um, and it's like, no, let's turn and let's look at the hard stuff. Let's look death in the eye. Uh, because it's not fear that we'll end up with. Maybe at first, maybe it'll be scary. Um, but what we'll end up with is uh, a greater awareness, a deeper compassion, uh, a greater gratitude for uh, the simple things. Uh, and maybe we let go of the stories that we have about other people that keep us disconnected from them. We've, we uh, with this tendency to kind of fix other people in these stories that we have them in. Or fix it even worse, fix ourselves in one of those stories <laughs> we can't get out of. Um, and uh, you know, if we if we enter into this this presence, this this connecting where that goes beyond story, you know, what I call I call it living in the absence of story, um, because what's left is just simply my attention and my awareness and my connection. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's where the the deeper relationship happens. That's where you know. Um, it's harder to bring harm uh, 
or to uh, pass judgment or discriminate against when I have connection and relationship. Um, I can't remember, uh, my uh, partner was sharing a story with me. It may have been another Joanna Macy story, but it was uh, about the folks that cut down, you know, these great trees. Um, and it's like, well, what if I entered into relationship with the man who's cutting the tree, who is actually just simply the, trying to feed his family? And he's just doing this because, you know, this is what his, his people have done for generations. I don't know that man. I haven't had, I haven't uh, shared bread with him. I don't know what's in his heart. I don't know his family. So it's, it's, you know, it's this way of, uh, that's the place of coming together. You know, it's, uh, it's easy to pass judgments on, on categories of, of things and people. Um, it's more of a challenge to, to reach out and connect, to see and be seen. Um, but that's where, that's where change will happen. Um, yeah, and I think this is a wonderful practice that you have offered us here uh, to, just, to just go outside and just sit and just observe, and, but even more than that, be observed. Yeah, I'll tell you, if you have kids, a friend of mine shared this, this story with me, something, he works with a lot of kids, and um, he said, yeah, uh, somebody asked him, he said, well, how do you teach kids? He said, I don't teach kids, I play with kids. Uh, <laughs> yes. said, what do you mean? He said, well, um, we'll have a group of kids, and we'll say, um, we'll be out in nature, and I want you to, I want you to, you kids, I want you to go find a hiding place. We'll see so you can find the best hiding place in nature, and we'll come look for you. He said, and then after they go hide, we'll spend 20 minutes just kind of sitting around. <laughs> because we know what's happening out there is that they're, you know, maybe their faces on the grass or they're watching bugs or they're listening to birds <laughs> they're on the earth. You know, they're out there in it, but they're playing a game. They don't know they're, they're in this relationship. It's a fun thing. Maybe, wow. maybe some parents could do that with their kids. Say, you should go find this hiding place in nature and I'll come look for you. Yeah. Give them at least 20 minutes before you go look. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for all that you have shared here, Cater. And I feel like we could keep talking for another hour. Um, but I want to go open up the Q&A for people who might have questions and want to engage with you. Um, but I also do want to share your, you have two wonderful free gifts that you're offering. Um, so would you like to tell a little bit about those two gifts? Uh, well, yes. One is if you, if, you, if you go to the website and sign up for the newsletter, you'll get an automatic uh, download of a, um, a story called Singing Stone. Um, it's a, it's a, where I, I use a, a djembe drum and I tell a story. And it's a story of the initiatory journey. Um, the other thing that I would like to put out there um, and I'm going to hold this out there for probably another week because I know some people won't get to listen to this right away, um, is for those people that sign up to the newsletter, um, I'm going to randomly choose seven people off of that list um, to give a 30-minute um, a uh, divination reading to. Um, and if you're curious about what all that means, you can go to the website and click on retreats and then click on uh, receive a private divination. Um, I did that before when we did this. It was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, thank and, you uh, for offering. That's like a, a random way of going through the list um, and, and choosing um, people's names that I don't know to be one of those seven. Wonderful. And w do you want to share a little bit about the work that you do and how people might um, engage with you going forward if they want to go deeper into this type of work? Sure, thank you for that invitation. Yeah, I have, um, uh, throughout the year, I have um, uh, an 11 day uh, vision quest or vision fast uh, village encampment uh, with a four day, four night vision fast ceremony that's involved in that. Um, that happens a couple of times a year for the general public. Also, I have a training program where I train people as ceremonial rites of passage guides. And that's a year and a half long program where we meet six times 
uh, six or, or five four day sessions over the year and then one day one 10 day session in which we go somewhere else in the country other than Asheville and do a vision quest um, with that training group um, there are other programs in Europe um, often do uh, uh, grief rituals um, that can and grief rituals are usually four day uh, rituals could be anywhere from 30 to 60 people um, for those type of rituals. And we have some of those coming up in, um, in the UK and um, looks like in uh, Australia and also um, Portugal next year. We're working out the details and also doing a um, guiding a vision quest uh, ceremony over in uh, Wales next spring. Um, other than that, just meeting one-on-one -on -one online like this or in person for divination um, is, is more the individual connection. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing those, those opportunities with people. It's so, so beautiful and so deeply needed what you are offering in the world. All right, should we should we risk the uh, video again, Jocelyn? Or <laughs> sure, we can. Yeah, let's give it a try. Let's see how it works. I just like uh, seeing seeing people when I talk with them. I know much <laughs> more connected that way. Okay, so for anyone who would like to ask Cater a question, you can raise your hand. So if you're when you're on Zoom, there's a hand icon at the near the bottom of the screen that says raise hand, so you can click there and we can bring you over to have a conversation. Or if you prefer, you can put your question in the chat or in the Q&A, and we will address the, as many of those questions as we can. Um, so let's see, Iptisam has asked in the Q&A, um, Cater, could you shed more light on what one can do while navigating the land betwixt and between? Um. That can be a tough place to be. Uh, yeah, absolutely, and and um, we all we're all going through them, and and we'll go through them multiple times in our life. I guess having a, a reliable guide, uh, uh, I've heard um, sometimes referenced as a soul guide, but someone that can guide you through these places um, that will help you look at it more mythologically than um, pathologically. Because um, oftentimes it is in these places of depression or anxiety or angst or, or uh, whatever our particular neuroses is gets stirred up um, where our, our culture wants to uh, pathologize the symptoms uh, and offer remedies by people who are just more clever at hiding their own challenges than we are. <laughs> so um, so having, a, having a reliable guide is, uh, is uh, that can help you navigate the territory and understand what what uh, what's involved in these periods of what I call soul's descent or betwixt in between um, and that can be uh, uh, you know a group that one attends like a support uh, a men's group a women's group or or a mentor um, someone ha who has uh, uh, been down that rabbit hole a few times um, and uh, can help you navigate the way that you see what's happening, because I think that's so so crucial. The language, remember I said when language informs perception and how we language our experience with a particular narrative uh, will tell us how to be in relationship with it. Mm -hmm. And so those are the places I see that are most helpful, having somebody say, oh, you know, you're encountering the gatekeepers and they're wanting you to surrender and I see there's some holding on happening and you, know, you may need to hold on as long as you need to or you're you know you're at the bottom of uh, Soul Canyon and um, and you are just don't have a clue what's going to happen next um, and maybe this is the place you sit and be still and, and wait for that thing to find you um, but that's as a uh, both as a ceremonial guide and as a you know career psychotherapist that's probably the biggest thing I see is is how we uh, the narrative we put around these betwixt in between places and yeah. how we look at them so again to mythologize them rather than pathologize them and have a really good guide to help navigate the territory okay 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very helpful. Let's see, we have some more questions here in the Q&A. Um, oh, this is an interesting one. Do you, do you know, Kate, or do you have examples of where um, the indigenous languages might use verbs where instead of nouns? Um, um, I know that's kind of a... Yeah, I'm trying to think of an example. I knew uh, in some of the research, I'm going way back to something I read a long time ago. Um, that studied uh, Aboriginal uh, culture and actually some of the brain structure of the ancient Aboriginal people mm -hmm. and could identify the, the book is called Awakening in the Aboriginal Dream Time. I can get that out. I do remember that. Matter of fact, it was um, when I asked Stephen Foster, what was the best book he ever read? He told me that book. So that was of course the first one I went out and got some 25, 30 years ago. Um, but it talks about how they didn't have categorical names for a lot of things. They had relationship names. Okay. Um, I know that a lot of cultures don't use, don't have a lot of indigenous people cultures don't have uh, like the word goodbye. Um, so you're always held in this context of relationship. Um, uh, well, here's a, here's a fun one. Um, it's uh, and this might take me back to my more of my back in my Celtic roots. Um, <laughs> the the origin of the word spelling um, comes from the understanding to cast a spell. Mm -hmm. And so, before language was written, when people started putting language down in symbols, they were highly suspect um, of what they were doing. And so this idea that they might be casting a spell. <laughs> wow. That's nice. um, and so the, now we have the word spelling. And it's okay. funny when I hear the word people say spelling, I think of like casting spells. Yeah. Doing something. Um, it's. Uh, yeah. When I think about some of the, some of the, the medicine names I've heard of people, they are like running deer, uh, laughing elk, um, uh, they're, they're more, they tell a story about something that's happening. Um, uh, so names are often places. Um, there's a, a practice in, in, um, at least I know in South Africa and I know in the Seminole tribe, which is a branch of the Cherokee, this idea where the, uh, after being born, the, the child will go and live for a short time with the elder, or with the grandparent, um, for the purpose of receiving a name. Um, and I one time worked with a young man um, from South Africa um, who was, uh, when, I, when he came to me, he was 17 and, and he was coming to me because he was in the whole world of drugs and gangs and all this other pseudo initiations. Um, but he had grown up until he was about seven or eight in South Africa in a village and then moved to a major metropolitan city here in the States. Mm. Um, and as a result, you know, sought out the pseudo initiations, but I asked him this question and I said, um, uh, tell me something about growing up in the village. And he said, you know, I, I went and lived with my grandmother for a while and she gave me this name. I said, well, you, can you write it down? And so he wrote down this really long name that was filled with um, e events in nature like lightning or rain or thunder. And there were some animals. So elements and animals um, in the name. And he said, you know, when I, when I left the village, I remember, um, and he looked off kind of in a distant stare. I remember she said to me, follow your name. Um, so that the name itself was something that one lives into. Uh, it's not simply a fixed description of who we see somebody to be, um, but it's more of a, um, a beacon or a directive or a pathway um, that one must live into. Um, so often when I hear medicine names that people give themselves or acquire from others, they're often given from the place of uh, describing somebody. Um, and I say, no, uh, uh, an uh, accurate medicine name or accurate name like that would probably not feel very comfortable to you. You might even not want to say it out loud. 
because there's a responsibility to a vision that it holds that you have to live into. And often these names were, again, they're not fixed. They're more like a, a action and, and verbs in there. Yeah, um, in motion. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Those were some amazing examples. Um, let me bring Remco over. He is raising his hand here. Hi, Remco. Welcome. Good to see you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Same Hi, here. Um, before I ask a question, Keda, I want to share with you that the way I experience you is with the openness and a freshness and a calmness that I normally only get when I'm out in the wild. And I'll get it for my own living room. So <laughs> thank you for that. I just, I just um, got out of about three weeks in the wild, so it's going to... Ah. You're carrying that with you. I'm inundated <laughs> with it at the moment. <laughs> okay, so that's what I experience. Oh, okay. I have a question about the ceremony you talked about of the rite of passage. Mm -hmm. um, as there is a difference between the feminine and the masculine energy, is that also something that is reflected in the ceremony itself? Um, the, depending on... Uh, who is who is going through the ceremony? Yeah. Um, so we could say, um, well, I like to say the sisters, brothers, or others. So there's masculine, and feminine, and there are many others. So just in an inclusion inclusion way, the 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 passage right would be if it was specific to um, a particular people, it would look a little different. Um, the three common elements of, if we looked across the planet throughout history, there are three common elements, or we could say even taboos and, and rites of passage. Um, and that is fasting, exposure, and solitude. Now, after that, what it looks like can look really different. It could last a week, it could last a year. Um, but within, and it's usually guided by an elder, um, but sometime within that, time frame uh, there will be a period of fasting solitude and exposure to the natural world um, so i could say those are the common elements of initiatory rites of passages and then the um that we, we could say are pan cultural um, but specific ceremonies uh or, that are specific to particular cultures would look different um, so there's those things that are pan-cultural and then there's things specific to a, a tribe uh, or a particular community or even a family um, may have a certain way of doing something. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your question, Remco. You're welcome. Have a wonderful day. Same to you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, thank you, Cater. Let's see. Um, I have I have a question actually. I I um, this was just kind of came up for me as you were answering that last one. You know, I have I guess I've heard this in some ways, but I've always perceived you know that these like vision quest and these and um, in indigenous ceremonies that are very sacred are are kind of designed to push us to the edge of what we can handle right and mm -hmm. and that that makes us stronger mm -hmm. um and so that's that's kind of a view that i've adopted in looking at this whole you know the radical change that's happening in our world right now you know that this is that this is making us into who we need to be mm -hmm. to move to the next level would you agree with that and do you have do you have any comments on that yeah these uh rites of passage ceremonies are actually designed to push us beyond what we have personal resource to handle. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the crossing of that threshold where um, like, I can't do this by myself. I have to reach out beyond me, you know, and in recovery circles, the language of, of higher power or, or creator or great spirit in other circles. It's, it's, I have to reach beyond my own willpower, my own resourcefulness. Um, it's going to be an experience that takes me to that edge um, that edge of uncertainty. Um, if it were something I could simply 
comfortably go through with my own strategic thinking and, and willpower, um, then it wouldn't be all that it could be. Um, it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't challenge me to surrender. Um, so it's, it takes us to a place beyond our beliefs, um, beyond our, beyond faith. Like it's like the absence of those things, the in-between place of those things. Uh, we're all this, that's why I love the, when we talk about wor words that are verbs, that word, the Lakota use of humblecha to cry for a vision. And that really speaks to the heart of, you know, uh, what's happening. Um, so it's, um, so yeah, it's, it does, and, and yeah, globally, we're in that place. The planet's in that place, and, and you know, us being the part of the, the walking, talking consciousness of the earth, uh, we're being asked to, uh, to re-dream. The way I think about it is that we're dreamed into being by the earth ancestrally, and our, and our responsibility now is to re-dream this reciprocal re-dreaming of a new earth. Um, so this uh, reciprocal dreaming that happens. Um, yes, and we each have the the opportunity to contribute to that dreaming. Yes, and and we are not just not have the opportunity. We're doing it, whether we do it consciously right, or not. Right, doing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> whether we whether we're really engaged or not. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I'm just looking. I think we can do one more question here. So let's see. So Deborah, would you, oh good, you're raising your hand, awesome. Cause I was reading your question in the Q and A, but I would love to have you ask this yourself. <laughs> so bring you over now. Hi Deborah, welcome. Hi. It's a great question. I'm so glad you raised your hand to Hi, ask Deborah. this person. Hi, thank you so much for this today. It's uh, welcome. very beautiful and speaks, uh, to, speaks to my heart and uh, the path that I have followed and that has spoken to me many years ago was, um, you know, the indigenous path of, of, of you know, indigenous sacred teachings. Um, and so uh, what I was wondering um, was to know a little bit more and hear your perspective on um, the crack between the worlds as I was taught it it was and experienced such in various you know ceremony in um you know sacred sweat lodges and it being kind of that liminal space mm -hmm. um between you know this world and the other world the more mystical um divine mm -hmm. world and um, yeah, I just love to hear you speak a little bit more to the crack between the worlds. Um, yeah, that's come up recently, actually, and, and I'm reminded of a teach uh, uh, a discussion I had with my teacher um, some years ago. Will Rocking Bear, um, he's an elder Cherokee, no longer on the planet, um, still a wonderful teacher, by the way, <laughs> and. Um, he said, I, you know, I, I can't treat them like two worlds anymore. It's just too much work. And um, so this way of, of navigating the territory by, um, you know, the liminal space, the thin space uh, is, is really, a, as we could say, as Castaneda would reference, it's a shift in attention. In the old Irish mythologies, the other world was not an other, it was simply nature. Um, like nature was imbued with, with, uh, with spirit. And so it wasn't this sense of uh, kind of an other realm. It was this realm and it was there. Um, and so my personal experience is, uh, you know, through ritual and ceremony that is that simply with a shift of attention, it opens up. Um, or at least what opens up is my awareness of it. Um, it's always there. Um, and, um, and there are, you know, the, the liminal space or thin place, there are certain uh, 
moments that uh, encourage it. For me, it's uh, standing by a river in early morning mist. Um, the ability to shift to shift my awareness to to that realm is just so easy. Um, you know, certain times of day, certain times of night, where the the veil in nature is is uh, conducive and supportive to to our easily connecting in. You know, we're coming up to that time of year um, here with uh, Salwin. This uh, where we're going to enter the darkest time of the year here pretty soon. Um, and so that place in the year where the veil is considered thin, um, Day of the Dead, and all the different names that 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 period of the year has in different cultures. Um, and the, uh, yeah, so this, this idea of the, the crack between the worlds, um, I would say it's, it's a chasm right now. <laughs> it's a big, it's wide open. Um, and, uh, and to give our attention to it, um, and, and let it give its, you know, make ourselves available to it, given attention to us. Um, I have countless stories of, of encounters in the crack and, and uh, things like that that have happened. Uh, but, um, but I'm working to, you know, another uh, wonderful phrase I took from a, my um, Cherokee teacher around this whole other world and his saying, you know, I, I can't do that anymore. It's just too much work. <laughs> uh, he said, you know, you want to, you want to practice living your life as a ceremony. Um, so this idea of to live my life as an, a ceremony for me means to bring a, a, a deeper level of attention and awareness um, to that crack being wide open all the time. You know, whether I'm, you know, walking in Best Buy to, to get a phone or whether I'm deep in the wilderness in ceremony, um, how can I be aware that the, the crack is always uh, like an open door? Uh, there's this, all, this constant invitation um, where the crack is. Um, so I think in my, in my judgment, um, that we're moving closer to seeing the the other world model of talking about the spirit realm is is uh commingling with this world and they're the, they're really the same world um and that what what uh and what can be deeply moving and spiritual um is is less about uh having some grand vision of of um uh, you know, angels and allies and guardians and more about, you know, sitting with a friend in their grief. You know, that's a deeply sacred moment. Um, sitting with a friend in their rage, another deeply sacred moment. Um, you know, and, and this idea of uh, the separation that occurred a long time ago in that perspective. Um, I think that's part of what's vanishing. Um, and it enables us to have more access and resource of communication back and forth between the realms. Um, and that I've experienced a lot with, uh, in some really profound ways, uh, particularly with the ancestral realm. So, hope that's stimulating and, and helpful. It's, it's very stimulating and very helpful and very... I feel so much at peace with what you shared, and I, f I feel that, and um, you know, I totally agree with everything you've said. And being in that space, whether it be out in nature or with another person, yes, it is. It is that. It is that moment, mm -hmm. um, and it, I agree. It is here all the time. And it's a reminder for me also to, um, like I don't talk about, about this sort of, you know, thing on a daily basis because most people, well, not most, but many people don't, don't get it. So um, to be here right now in this community, um, to be able to, you know, to share, 
to share this is is very profound and um and it, uh, and, and um, it was many many years ago i i was given uh uh, well, I was given two names, one in which I can share, you know, in, in public without being in ceremony. Um, and it exactly what you said, it's something, it's a name, the elders, the grandmothers gave to me, you know, after a long while of, 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 of being with them and spending time with them. Um, and it, 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 it is warrior woman of the fire. Mm -hmm. And they, they did tell me that that would be a name for me to grow into, to step up and into over, you know, over the years mm -hmm. since. Um, and so I feel that deeply and, and deeply and profoundly again today. And, uh, and, that, and that doesn't look, that warrior does not look tough or hard it is you know it's about being truthful to oneself and uh you know loving uh toward everyone and everything and and every situation and acceptance of and to be that just to be that and um if that is transformative to to someone else wonderful you know um but it's not about doing or being anything that is not who and what I am in, inside. Right. Yeah. To have it, to be given a name that takes a lifetime to live into, that's a good name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm very grateful. Thank well, you so for being much. On, Deborah. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Deborah. Have a wonderful day. Hope we'll see you on more calls today. <laughs> I have to go to work. <laughs> oh, okay. Later then. <laughs> so there's a funny, I'm just going to, this is just crazy, but uh, um, like, you know what I do, Jocelyn. And um, so I have to go to work today and I'm on a film set and I'm cast as a character. And what it is, it's, I will be painted and stuff. And it is, um, I'm playing a human in a cage. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow, I just, I just think, wow, you know, I'm playing out in my life the parts of me that are, you know, inside. Mm -hmm. Wow, just blows my mind, actually. Yeah, yeah. So I hope I get out. <laughs> yeah. Wow, strength to you in that, in that role. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Wow. Thank I'll be thinking of you later. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Many blessings to you. Deborah. Many blessings to you both and cool. everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think we are at the time to end the call here. Um, Cater, I just want to thank you so much. Um, this has been really, really deeply profound and, um, I've, I've learned a lot. I learned so much every single time I have a conversation with you. So thank you for sharing your wisdom. Yeah, thank you for the way. invitation to, to be on. And um, yeah, maybe we, maybe we live into a life that blesses our, our grandchildren. Um, oh. Mm -hmm. Yes. And thank you everyone who is attending live and everyone who's watching this as a recording. Um, I hope you have really enjoyed this presentation. I hope it will be deeply meaningful for you in your life, too. All right. Well, thank you so much, Cater. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. You too. Go well. Thank you.